I've been a consultant hematologist for far too many years, but I've increasingly over the decades been in, interested in young adults with hematological malignancies. Um, and in fact, now at Guys and Thomas's, I run a psychosocial support uh, service for young adults with all cancers. But it's the leukemias and the very aggressive lymphomas that as a hematologist have interested me been increasingly aware over the decades that there's very little information about how young people are treated and their outcomes. What I have realized is that they can be, the leukemias are fairly consistent, but the lymphomas, there's a lot of inconsistency about how they're treated. And of course, none of them get into clinical trials. So we don't get that insight that we do for children or older adults. It seemed the only way of doing this was to try and do a whole population study. Now, there are two sources of information. There's the cancer registry, which gives an overview of patient demographics, diagnosis and deaths, but no information on staging and treatment. But if I was really going to understand how they were treated and what their outcomes were, I would need a consented cohort as well. And that involved enlisting my colleagues around the country who have absolutely been brilliant because they were had to produce or give me a lot of information. Mostly that was done by research nurses and specialist nurses. But let me think, go to the whole population data first, because the first thing that was interesting about the cancer registry is comparing uh, the uh, information on diagnosis in the cancer registry with those patients who were consented. There was quite a lot of misdiagnosis in the cancer registry, probably about uh, at least 15% of, of 10, 15% of diagnoses were either imprecise. In other words, it didn't give you the subtype of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, and some were just completely wrong. Um, but nonetheless, it did give us a very good overview. And in the poster that I've done and in the presentation, um, you will see that the, 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 the incidence by age group and the mortality. And what's interesting, but perhaps, well, I suppose not surprising, is that the incidence of the individual lymphomas goes up with age. So in fact, the number of patients diagnosed in the 25 to 29 year old age group is um, equivalent to those in the previous 10 years, which is the 15 to, uh, to 25. So, so increases with age, which we particularly know, and that's largely driven by diffuse large B-cell lymphomas. As far as the outcomes are concerned, I suppose many of them, but I'm going to, well, let's, 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 let's sorry, I'm going to go back and, and think about the, um, uh, the, the registry cohort. I think the interesting part about the registry cohort that I wanted to look at is not so much treatment, but just to get an overview of incidents and outcomes, but also to look at whether the place of care was important. And when I wrote the abstract, it looked as though that patients treated at smaller hospitals, district hospitals, had worse outcomes overall, taking NHL as a whole. But when I actually got a final um, vital status, a live death out, um, output from the cancer registry, which was delayed by the COVID pandemic, it appeared that that had gone away. And actually that makes sense because although about 85% of the patients probably um, were treated at major cancer centers, about 15% weren't. But those patients treated at smaller hospitals will all link in with the network multidisciplinary meetings. So even those treated at smaller hospitals were probably, their treatment was decided you know, by, by experts in the field. But where the smaller hospitals had a problem, it seemed, and if you look at some of the graphs, particularly in the, uh, in, in the oral presentation, you will see that there were some very early deaths in non-specialist hospitals. And I think that reflects that some patients, young patients come into hospital very sick um, with delayed diagnosis. And the delayed diagnosis issue is described in the poster that I did. And I think that those very sick patients need really specialist intensive care to keep them alive. But after that first stage, they do equally well. Thinking about the consented cohort, the most interesting thing that came out of it was the 
response and outcomes with different treatments are for Burkitt's lymphoma. And there are two treatments that tend to be used in the UK. There's Codox MIVAC, which is primarily the adult protocol. But the Europeans use the European um, LMB uh, protocol for actually children with all forms of lymphoma, but they use it into the adult age group or the adolescent age group with um, Burkitt's lymphoma. And comparing the outcomes of this age group that I was looking at between 16 and 29, um, those treated with the LMB protocol did a great deal better than those treated with Codox MIVAC. One argument might be that actually the biology changes, but there's good literature to show, to show that the biology really doesn't change with age. Um, and the other question was, is it differential use of rituximab. But in fact, those treated with Codox M, IVAC tended to have rituximab as well. The small number of patients treated with um, the LMB protocol actually often didn't. So the inferior survival with Codox M, IVAC is a real issue. And I think in the UK, if there's one thing that this study achieves, it will perhaps be to change Burkitt patients in this age group being treated with a, a more pediatric approach and the European LMB protocol. And if the study achieves that just one outcome of improving the treatment and outcome of Burkitt's lymphoma, I will be happy regardless of anything else.